Let's pray. Pour your spirit out, Lord. Your people have gathered. We have joined together in this place. We have lifted our voices in unison, in prayer and in praise. We have heard your word read. And we trust, God, that you have opened Scripture to us, that you have already opened us to Scripture. And now, God, we pray that you will allow your servant to hide beneath the shadow of the cross. That the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts are pleasing to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So I don't, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to put words in yours or anybody else's mouth. But it occurs to me that, that, that since you are here in this place where people gather uh, to uh, worship, we, and we not only worship, we gather together with each other in order to, in order to get close to or have a, an encounter with God, since we're all gathered here together, I, I'm guessing that, that you like the idea of getting close to and encountering God. I like the idea of, of getting close to God, having, having a, a holy encounter. There's, there's something that, that, that's quite appealing uh, to me about that. Speaking directly with and directly to God Receiving clear instruction uh, about uh, uh, what God would have us do and what God, what God would have us not do. Never having to wonder about, about our next step. Never, never having to, uh, to worry about what word to speak, what action to take. Knowing uh, that, that because we've gotten closer to God, our life will, will have instantly gotten uh, smoother and easier. Never being confused about anything on any matter, any time. Always having divine clarity on every subject. That would be so cool. Only here's the thing. Regardless of what some people may have told us, we all know, at least I think we all know, we should all know, that it doesn't really work that way. At least not all the time. We all know, or at least we should all know, if we really read the stories about the people in the Bible who have this close and intimate relationship with, with God, we, we know, or we should know, that those folks often have uh, their, their lives uh, turned upside down and thrown, thrown into chaos. They, they, they regularly struggle with great adversity. They are sent to the margins of society, and they deal with difficult and sometimes hostile people sometimes they are even killed all because of this intimate, close, loving relationship with the Almighty. And, and, and if the threat of great adversity, of, of, of great uh, anxieties at times of, uh, of, of, this, of this tremendous disruption, maybe even the threat of death, if that's not enough to frighten us away, then we all know, or at least we should all know, if we spend any time at all working on building this close relationship with God, with the God that will, that will most likely uh, send our lives into chaos... We should know that we won't always know why God has put us in the places or the situations in which we find ourselves. We discover, we discover that there, 
that, there, that there's often much more confusion than clarity in our lives. We, we, we discover that there are far more questions that arise then there are answers, especially easy answers or, or, or straight answers. And we discover all of this the more we get closer to God. At least that's been my experience. Having said all that, I'm sure that you all are feeling, are, are, are feeling uh, much more uh, reassured and comforted right now. Right? <laughs> and we need look no further than the assigned lectionary passages for the day today to see a wonderful example of, of all this. The lection uh, pairs uh, the, the reading out of John's gospel today with a reading out of, of Acts, uh, at chapter 7 uh, in particular in uh, the book of Acts. And, and even though we didn't read this passage out of Acts this morning, allow me, to, allow me to paraphrase it for you real briefly. In seventh chapter of Acts, uh, we, we, we encounter uh, this person named Stephen. And Stephen is the, is the person, uh, the one chosen by the disciples to take the place of Judas after Judas's death. And in the seventh chapter of Acts, Stephen uh, is, is filled with the Holy Spirit. And Stephen is not an eloquent speaker. Stephen is, is filled with the Holy Spirit, and he, and he begins to preach, but not to a, a church full of wonderful folk like us. Stephen begins to preach to a hostile crowd. And the response that he gets is not a response that would, that would motivate any sane person to become a preacher. The crowd, the, the, the group that is gathered, uh, they become enraged at, at his message. They, uh, they rush him. They scream at him. They drag him out to the edge of the city, out beyond the walls, and they stone him to death. And in the middle of, of this attack, Stephen prays. And, and, and he prays that God will receive his spirit. And, and he prays that God will forgive those who are throwing the stones. And then we are told Stephen dies peacefully. Even though, even though this is clearly a horrific and violent end. I read that story this week. And I don't know if this is an indictment on the way that my mind works. But I kept hearing, kept hearing this tagline from a Christian radio station running through my head. <laughs> Positive and encouraging, Caleb. <laughs> Still, in light of the climate of the world in which we live, in light of the climate of what all is going on in the United Methodist Church. I think this story has something to say to us. As, as conversations about all manner of things 
are going on in the world as conversations about what is going on in the United Methodist Church uh, have uh, become increasingly more and more emotional and animated and hostile. And, and, and people on every side of every issue have, have hurt others and have themselves been hurt and wounded. And, 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 we, and we, all, we all wonder in our minds, even if we don't say it out loud, is there anything positive and encouraging about any of this? And I'm reminded that just as he was for Stephen, that Christ is there in the middle of the chaos. Because if you go back and read the story, Jesus appears. And so from, from, this, from this positively encouraging scene of Stephen's death, we go to our gospel reading this morning out of the 14th chapter of John's gospel where Jesus is apparently and quite unexpectedly telling the disciples, his closest followers, the people that he's, that he's spent the most time with over the last three years, telling them that he is going to die. But, he says, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't be troubled. I'm going to come back and get you. Take you to be with me. And then he follows up this bit of confusing good news with the clear as mud assertion that they should all already know the way to where he's going. <laughs> they should all already know exactly what he's talking about. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and just said, What? <laughs> what? I can, I can imagine in my mind's eye all the confusion that the disciples uh, had and, and, and what, uh, what they were, were feeling, but were afraid to admit. I can imagine in my mind's eye that, that all the questions that must have been racing through their heads, but they were, they were too timid to ask until, until Thomas rather hopelessly exclaims, no, Lord, no, we don't know. We don't understand. And then in my, in my mind's eye, it seems like the, the floodgates of the questions would have burst open and all these questions would have come forth from all the disciples. And, and they're not dissimilar from many of the questions that we wrestle with and that we ask or that we, that we have in our mind that we're too afraid to ask today, especially in the United Methodist Church. What do you mean, don't be troubled? What's going to happen to us? Why does this have to happen? How are, how are you going to come back and get us if you're dead? We don't even know where you're going. How can we possibly, how can we possibly know the way? Where, where, tell me where is God in all of this? And if there, if there were questions, if there were questions for the earliest and the closest followers of Jesus, those who, those who knew him best, those who, who had the most intimate relationship with him, then surely, surely it cannot, it cannot uh, be 
uh, unusual for people like us who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, who are being encouraged daily by folk like me to just have faith, to just believe, just Give your lives in service to this very same Jesus. Surely it can't be unusual for us to have questions as well. Right? And again, I'm, I'm not trying, I am not trying to put words into your mouths, but there are questions that I believe are normal and even appropriate for all of us. If this, is, if this is the kind of thing our faith leads us to, being uh, like or ending up like Stephen, who would really want that? Did, didn't, didn't Jesus come to save and protect us and give us abundant life? I mean, we talked about that last week. Then, then what is all this business about self-sacrifice and picking up crosses and dying in this life? What is all that about? What, what, wasn't, wasn't Jesus murdered for us and, and, and wasn't he murdered for his, for his testimony and allegiance to God? And now, and now he wants us to get in on some of that too? These are tough questions. These are tough questions, but they are absolutely legitimate questions. And not only is it okay for us to ask these questions, I think we must ask these questions. We must ask these questions. Friends, don't do not, hear me, do not ever, ever, ever let anyone tell you that you have to find, that you have to blindly follow Jesus or never ask questions about Scripture. I'll say that again. Do not ever let anyone tell you that you have to blindly follow and never question Scripture. Questions are inherent to who we are as people of faith. Do you know there's over, there's over 3,300 questions in Scripture, recorded in Scripture? Jesus, Jesus himself asked over 300 questions. He is asked by others almost 200 questions. And, and you know how many out of 200 questions, almost 200 questions, you know how many questions Jesus answers? <laughs> Three. <laughs> yes. Yes. We are expected to take those steps of faith at various times in our lives that will lead to the unknown. Yes, we are all going to face situations in which we cannot know the outcome except through wading into and journeying through the unknown with Almighty God at our side. But Jesus Christ will never ever chastise us or reject us for asking questions. In fact, in fact, Jesus tells us that we are to ask questions, that we are to count the cost. Go home today, read the end of the 14th chapter of Luke. We are to count the cost, we are to ask so ask, consider, ponder, mull over, wrestle with, work through, inquire. 
do all of this before you ever sign up with Jesus. Our, as followers of Jesus Christ, our purpose, our, our task, our job, if you will, is to love God and, and love others. And we do that by pointing folks to, or maybe it's better, it would be better said by, by, allowing, by allowing folks to see God in us and to see God through us and to experience God through us. So everything that we do, everything, every way that we act, every word that we speak, we should be seeking to, uh, uh, to, to embody this genuine faith. And, and that faith has to be, it must be grounded in honesty, rooted in transparency, and genuinely reflect the grace and the goodness, the tenderness and the openness, the love and the mercy of Jesus Christ. The same Jesus whose image we are continually to strive to mirror. The, who, the, 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 the same Jesus whose, um, whose, um, whose, whose life and actions we are to embody. Anything less, anything less minimizes and distorts the image of God. And that is a high and a holy calling. And it's not just for preachers. It's for all of us. All of us. And, 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 and such a life is, is unbelievably rewarding and fulfilling and complete. It is, also, it is also extremely challenging and demanding and incredibly life disrupting. It requires growth and transformation and change. And we all know, or at least we, we should know, that those things can be difficult. So Jesus wants us to be fully aware. Jesus gives full disclosure because, because he knows. He knew then, he knows now that some, sometimes being a follower of his means that we will be treated like he was. Proclaiming our faith and living out that faith by speaking out for justice, acting with love towards all, standing with those who cannot stand by themselves, living for and giving our lives to others in the strong name of Jesus Christ because these are the things that he did can sometimes mean that some folk will be offended. And that might have consequences. Maybe, maybe not death and martyrdom like it was for Stephen, but consequences that will change our lives and put us at odds with people we know and people we don't. Put us at odds with people in authority over us and with people over whom we have authority. People we work with, maybe our friends, maybe even our own families. Giving, 
giving our lives to something bigger than ourselves sometimes means that it comes with risk. But if we want full, meaningful, abundant lives like we talked about last week, if, if we desire to really be faithful followers of Jesus Christ, should we not expect at least a little risk? Regardless of where we find ourselves in this journey through life, whether we, whether we identify as one who walks daily with Christ or whether, or whether we identify ourselves as one who isn't quite sure what we believe, at least not yet, maybe, maybe it, it says we identify ourselves as one whose heart is troubled and racing with anxiety because there's a few of us who have troubled hearts and anxious minds. Maybe, maybe we identify ourselves as one who is angry and confused and sometimes we're angry and confused about what we don't know maybe maybe we even identify ourselves as someone who is full of doubt but regardless of how we identify ourselves Jesus says bring your questions bring your hardest most difficult most challenging question to God. Because God can handle it. <laughs> In fact, God wants those questions. Whether, whether you realize it or not, asking these difficult kinds of questions, wrestling with these answers is not just the first step of faith. It, it, is, it is an ongoing act of great faith to ask questions. And I believe that when we ask such questions, that the promise that Jesus made to Philip and the promise given to Stephen will be ours as well. That Jesus who preached mercy and taught love, and the one who healed and fed and conquered death will reveal to us nothing less, nothing less than Almighty God and God's great and perfect love for us, for us all, for you and for me and for the whole world. And I believe, I know, this is good news. May we, may we always know it and believe it and embody it. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.